Hey everybody, today I'm going to be reviewing Lux Aeterna, which is directed by Gaspar Noe. It came out in 2019. Unfortunately, I haven't gotten around to it until uh, now, but it is uh, Gaspar Noe's stab at like a meta mockumentary thesis on creativity, the birth of creativity, and the positive and negative effects of it. And of course, the huge key to his films is the visceral experience of the forging of whatever it is he's, he's trying to create here. And uh, it's something that Noe just really gets high off of. The concept of suffering as a means to break through creatively or in an artistic way, obviously, uh, is the key here. And that's something that uh, Noe is naturally captivated by. It's something I'm captivated by. And I think that's maybe why I share, uh, or at least I'm interested in his particular brand of uh, filmmaking. Uh, just because, yes, I, I do believe as well. Um, I'm not saying it's a good thing always, but I do think in order to evolve, often we have to suffer as uh, human beings. And uh, sometimes you can take that into sadistic or masochistic areas. And for him, his means of creativity is very almost ayahuasca-like. You know, it's like you're regurgitating all these impurities of the soul in order to, you know, it's like you're working towards something to reach the peak of, of transcendence. And I've always loved that he uses that idea through the framework of kind of like art and psychedelic uh, philosophy. And he seems to have capitalized on a formula that, you know, really speaks to him as of now, uh, where he is taking you, as I said, through an experience, through like a sort of winding tunnel, and you're plunged into this world, and you only have maybe like a thin sketch of a narrative, a thin sketch of, of characters, really. Often it's barely thought through. It feels slapped together. That's just a no-way thing. Um, but eventually it's going to evaporate, and eventually all of the things that uh, feel familiar are gone. And that is when all of the subliminal ideas that pertain to cinema and, you know, like the psychedelic experience, the cinematic experience, all of it is going to uh, merge together and come to fruition in the finale of the film. His movies are always hypnotic. They're always soporific. They, they have a quality where they feel like a ride or they feel, it's almost like you can feel that synthetic kind of, uh, bitterness of LSD through your skin and your mouth as you're watching his movies. It's kind of amazing. And yet, as I said, there is a definite formula to the madness of it all, and it has become more stark, more clear uh, in his last two films in particular, this one and uh, Climax. Now, is that a good or a bad thing? Well, that is the question. The opening of this film is very persona Ingmar Bergman-like in that it's, it's like this pastiche of all kinds of historical uh, films done in a very subliminal, very hypnotic way, and uh, it basically feels like you know he's presenting his thesis fully here, and it's going to ring throughout the film. And looking at all these different clips from all of these old movies, of course, the art lover that Noe is, um, he has a great appreciation for directors that I also uh, love myself, and um, one of them being Carl Dreyer. One of my favorite films that he did was Day of Wrath, and we are given a clip from Day of Wrath here, which is a a rare treat for me, but he's using a very important scene and a very important image from the film that is going to, he's basically going to bookend it with his own version of the image, his own, like putting his own spin on it in a way. Um, but yeah, the scene from Day of Wrath is, is the scene where um, the old woman is accused of being a witch. So she's like, you know, on that cross sort of thing and she's going to be burned for it. And that's the thing about Carl Dreyer. And I understand why Noe likes him a lot because with his movies, uh, just the images, images in them are so stark and so powerful and, and they leave such an impression on you. Joan of Arc as an example. But, you know, he can take all of these historical periods and bring them into the cinema in a way that feels incredibly modern. And a lot of period pieces, I feel like they miss a lot of the grit. They feel very removed, but with Dreyer, you feel everything. I mean, you really do feel the suffering and the brutality. Brutality that might have been more commonplace in, you know, earlier periods of history. Um, but when we watch these movies, we feel as though we're getting a taste of, of what it's really like, or just kind of getting a peek into what it really might have been like in those times. Uh, but of course, we're not experiencing it. It's all, it's all an illusion. These stark images of suffering are created. You know, it's a form of manipulation, and the images and the sounds and the editing are all working together to make you feel something, whether that is a complex thing or, or not a complex thing. There is an aspect to that in, in pretty much every single film that, that exists. And, um, you know, there are some negatives to that. I think there are some exploitive aspects to that that Noe is very interested in as well. Often sacrifice has to happen in order for something to really work. It's kind of like, uh, you know, like notorious stories of Stanley Kubrick really being tough on Shelley Duvall and doing take after take until finally you arrive at something that, that feels like a creative breakthrough. It sounds counterintuitive, but from, 
you know, a, a movie making standpoint, it really does take time in order to arrive at the simulation of authenticity, if that makes any sense. I even look at, you know, stories of actors that gain an excessive amount of weight for a role and then lose a ton of it. Like, you know, Robert De Niro will say in uh, Raging Bull, there is something very uh, intense about that. And it is a risk, you know, it can be dangerous health wise if you don't do it uh, properly. And yet that sacrifice, people go, why would you do that? That sacrifice can lead to a creative breakthrough because of the suffering you have to go through. You know, it's coming, I think, from a very honest place, at least it, that film did in particular. I think that's a very interesting idea to explore. But also I love the idea of exploring like the cinema and psychedelics and the idea of illusions and how similar they are. How we use movies to sort of vicariously experience something. We do the same thing when we take drugs, when we take mushrooms, uh, psychedelics of any kind. You might really be gaining something and yet it's not really concrete. It's not literal in, in reality. And so what does that say about people and, and kind of our interests in the modern day? I, I think that is something that is rarely explored in a way that I find to be satisfying. So I, I, I thought it was interesting that Noah is at least touching on that idea here. The idea, you know, of, of plunging yourself into a really scary experience, we'll say like a heroic dose of a, a psychedelic, and, um, you know, you go far enough, it's going to, your heart is going to really feel free enough to accept your own death. So I'm intrigued by that and I was interested to see where he would take it and I'm interested to see him take that idea uh, further in other movies as well. Um, but I will say this movie only really touches on it. It really only touches on a lot of things. Um, the movie as it begins after that big opening sequence, um, it has a very Inland Empire style to it. It's a mockumentary as I said. But as he often does, he's introducing some characters here and they just lay out the entire thesis and the whole summation of the film basically in that opening. And it's, you know, it's it's not my favorite thing that Noe does. When I watch these scenes, it kind of feels as though Noe just got really drunk and decided to hit the Word document and he just ranted uh, drunkenly and he just decided, you know what, I'm gonna use this and um, make my character say it. But as I've said a million times in pretty much every review I have done for Noe, he is, writing is just not his strong suit. And uh, I don't think it's really his uh, particular interest. So, you know, whatever. But in terms of the experience, it is a very kinetic sort of behind the scenes look that feels very chaotic at times, which, you know, one would assume if you've ever worked in theater, if you've ever worked in film or anything, backstage is, is very crazy. There is a very kind of extroverted and paranoid uh, energy to it where the cameras are just sort of winding around the hallways as I said before and it just kind of eavesdrops on different people's conversations. It feels very much like a reality TV but there's like a buzzing sort of energy you feel that's kind of underlying and I like how you're able to see kind of the mundane aspects of creativity too or what leads to a creative process. In a way in that way it kind of reminds me of The Red Shoes which is a film that simultaneously includes kind of the fantasy and the breakthrough of creativity while also being a behind the scenes sort of story. That's a very hard thing to do and a very tough line to blend where it really works. Uh, but here I like that you're seeing all kinds of different facets to these creative types of people. It's not all good, certainly. You have these aspiring, wide-eyed, uh, innocent directors with all of these ideas and people that they want in their movies, but when it comes down to it, they are often, you know, shallow, selfish pricks, just like anyone else in the industry. You have actresses being exploited against their wishes. So, you know, it's it's a mosh pit of, of insanity, uh, the creative industry. I find it interesting that anytime I'm researching Gaspar Noy for a review or whatever, he's always criticized, it seems like, or at least this is what I perceive online. He always seems to be criticized for the way he perceives women. You'll see things like, oh, he's anti-woman. And I just, I think that is utterly absurd. When I watch a movie like Irreversible, I think, if anything, he's much more critical of masculinity and he seems to be more glorifying uh, femininity in that film. I know people think that's weird when I say that, but really, if you watch it again, you'll see that a lot of the themes are much more in favor of the female. And uh, yes, of course, cruelty is shown to both men and women in his films. But yeah, I just think that he likes to show people in a variety of different compromising positions. Because again, that's all part of his fascination and, and part of his whole creative philosophy. So I, I, again, I think that's all very silly, but I think here femininity is a very important thing um, because you, you're kind of contrasting between two 
very different feminine energies. You have the leader here who's like in place of the director. She's like this alpha female type of person, very aggressive sort of presence. And then you have also like on the other side, you have more of the passive and uh, submissive females that are more on the sides, whether they're like these objectified models or actresses, whatever. And I like that dichotomy because I think it's very important to establish that early on, a very strong female presence, especially having two females at the beginning of the film laying every thing out uh, is very important because the key here I think is for the masculine uh, presence to come in more and more as the film goes to kind of reclaim uh, that sense of, of dominance to the submissive. Earning back the control is really like the camera, having the camera yourself and, and basically the camera being this uh, phallic symbol and the objectified actresses that are like on the cross are of course the submissive. That give and take and that push and pull between uh, the males and females in all of his movies I find to be very interesting and, and, and not at all uh, pointedly against anyone. The film does use the split screen a lot, a lot, a lot, and um, so it's like where you have two cameras simultaneously going on at the same time. It is very reminiscent of a filmmaker like Brian De Palma. He loves that. I do like that effect at times, especially when things do feel really hectic and out of sorts, and the eye isn't going to be directed to one focal point. That can be actually a really effective model, but at the same time I also think it can be uh, distracting at times. It can detract from the core story. It feels a little too unfocused and it makes the experience just harder to gauge uh, as you're watching it, um, especially as it's starting to narrow to the conclusion. But as we narrow the focus and we hone in on that conclusion, I think the finale to this film is absolutely spectacular. I loved it. Um, because really, this is where the edges of the frame truly do uh, blend, and you are a part of the experience. It's that oneness. It is that spiritual connection that I'm always looking for in No Way Films, because he can he can handle it so well as a sensory sort of thing. And as I said, that cross image at the beginning used in uh, Day of Wrath, and in that opening, we see here again where the actresses are going to be like objectified, wearing, you know, very kind of sexy clothing, but also the mix of the color and the strobe lights just going on for a very long period of time. And Oh my God, my eyes were killing me. And it's so funny because with no way, you know, always, most always they'll say like, you know, if you struggle with epilepsy, don't watch his movies because you know, all the strobe lights and everything is going to be tough for you. And I, I have never had a problem even remotely. I just kind of shrug and go, Oh, well that's interesting. And just continue to watch. This is the first time that I actually, it really started to affect me. But yeah, my eyes were sore and I had like the worst headache after watching this film. A lot of it is because I just refused to look away. I, I had to look away a few times, couldn't help it because it was hurting, but it's like, you don't want to look away. And it almost feels as though it's challenging you to say, I dare you to look away, knowing that you're very likely not going to be able to watch the whole thing. And it is okay to look away, certainly. I am not discouraging that at all. Um, but yeah, something about those flickering lights and the strobe lights, you know, if you've ever experimented with them, the way it affects movement, the way it affects the way the light reaches your eye and all of that is so interesting. It's a very simple trick and yet it does wonders. It truly takes you somewhere else and you start to realize, oh, I see you know, what Noah is doing here. Because all the things he presented in his thesis are coming together in some form. Art as illusion, art as dis distortion and suffering, and you know, all those power dynamics that surround the art. And then pushing beyond what is familiar into the uncharted can be a very scary thing, especially for somebody who is a writer, a creative. It can be very exposing. And then when something magical happens, you arrive at this, this strange place that uh, you can't really uh, describe in this dimension at least. I was like, yes, this is the Noe that I love. This is the one that I always return to. I want him to go to points like this in his movies because they're the kinds of moments that I, I never forget. And as you're kind of stuck in this world where your eyes are just being messed with for so long, it's in those last couple of minutes, at least I have this experience where I started to see a tunnel that was reminiscent of like the DMT tunnel, which no complaints there. And then, it's over and it's wonderful, but I'm like, oh, you know, I kind of wanted more of that. I don't want it to sound like I don't like the film. I really like the film and I would like to see it again. I can see myself watching it uh, multiple times because it is also very short, um, but it does feel kind of like an in-between for Gaspar Noe. You know, it, it doesn't quite feel like a film because it's not, you know, very long, but it also 
It doesn't feel like a short film either. So it doesn't quite have the impact of a lot of his other films. And I wanted a lot of those ideas to be broadened and explored a little bit, maybe take them in more interesting directions. And I, I, I just wanted it to be longer. I do know that Noe loves shorter movies and he kind of misses the times like in the silent era where a movie could be you know about this length but the formula for this is very similar to that of climax and i think climax is a lot more effective because of that extra time even with its flaws as well um, but as it stands just overall the thesis itself is quite concise uh, as an experience it touches on a lot of things and it really does have its moments that i find truly breathtaking and really kind of touching on that breakthrough it really does reach a sense of true creative and spiritual uh liberation but only in glimpses it's not fleshed out or as daring as it might have been in a movie like into the void or irreversible nor does it have that like i said that dizzying thrill of a movie like uh, climax to the same degree and this is another thing that I do feel, and I, I just think it's important to bring up because it's something that I'm noticing. Part of me feels that Noe, as controversial as he's been in the past, um, and as polarizing as a lot of his movies have been to people, it seems as if he has settled into a formula, like I said uh, at the beginning, where he lays out the thesis very clearly and then kind of has a slow build to the climax and then the thesis comes to fruition in a way where you're seeing that death rebirth metaphor come through whether literal or figurative in some way and again all that is laid out in in the uh, exposition in the opening and that's fine you know Noe has used that in the past and I've been a, a big fan of it for sure um, but at the same time, I kind of feel like he's starting to go in circles uh, where it can feel a little bit predictable, which is completely counterintuitive to who he is just as a creator. I think his films and his ideas are important to have an evolving perspective. Into the Void, Climax, and this film, of course, all involve the, the death and rebirth concept in the end through some sort of creative enlightenment or, or, you know, human sacrifice, both. But there's always like a literal sound of a baby crying uh, in each one at the very end. And it's like at a certain point, it starts to feel a little bit derivative in the context of Gaspar Noé films, of course, in the context of his particular canon. Um, and I have said this so many times, and I'm sorry to be uh, redundant, but, you know, as often with controversial creative people that are praised for that controversy. They hide behind the controversy and ultimately then it doesn't really mean anything because you're not exploring it. It no longer feels organic or like you're pushing anywhere interesting and I, I don't necessarily believe that's happening to no way um, but I do kind of worry about it. And that's something where it's like, you know, you're, if you're that kind of filmmaker, those are the sorts of things that you need to face at a certain point when you've made a, a, you know, a good amount of films like he has. However, I do really like this movie. I'm not saying that I don't. It's just not my favorite Noe film. I've seen him uh, be more interesting as a director. It's still reaching at times to the upper echelons of some of the most immersive film experiences I've had. At the end of the day, I don't think it's just pure um, masochism. I don't feel like it's truly just like dark and nihilistic or anything like that. A lot of people think, oh, you know, his movies just mainly amount to self-abuse. I, I don't think it's that simple. I think it's a mix of self self-abuse and creative revelation for better or worse and I find that gray area very interesting and the shamelessness with which he goes about it I can't help but admire even when it doesn't always work for me and there's something very childlike and exciting about when he explores things where he's just really he doesn't care about a lot of the things that most filmmakers care about and it's just it's very refreshing to me and I still really love him and I'm very excited for his next film but uh, that is my review thank you guys so much for watching I'm going to plug my website as always it is deepfocuslens.com I am an artist and I do commission portraits and I sell prints of my work if that's something you're interested in you can always go to the website below and if you have a question about a commission or a print you can always email me my email is in the description box below also I want to give a big shout out to my patrons who are wonderful. Thank you guys so much for all of your support. If you're interested in supporting, the link for that is below as well as the rest of my social media information. You can watch more videos here and you can subscribe if you'd like. Catch you next time.